Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. Roll up your sleeves because holiday shopping is not done until I say so. Everything you see on the table, of course, is for sale with names, references, and prices for all these watches in the description below. I also have the direct service inquiry line. Email tmasso at thewatchbox.com going straight to me and my crew to answer the questions you have about these watches. All right, let's get started with something that absolutely pegs the meter. Let's get started with the Vacheron Constantin Malt Chronograph. 41.5 millimeters in white gold. This is an overload of luxury horology. No, high horology, because what you're looking at here is a truly handmade watch. Let me relieve it of my fingerprints because it deserves better. It is not a petite watch. At 41.5 millimeters, this model, launched back in 2004, is an absolute stunner reference. 47120, 41.5 millimeters in white gold, with those characteristic malt style lugs that debuted at the beginning of the 2000s. And of course, before it became a tonneau collection, the malt collection was defined by its robust, thrusting, full volume fluted and styled lugs that gave the watch the character that you see here without excess size. 41 is full-sized, it's not oversized, and all of the personality comes from those broadsword hands and the malt-style lugs. On my wrist, 16 centimeters in circumference, you can see the watch wears easily. It's broad, but not too broad. It's large, but not too large. And, as you'll appreciate, it's quite flat on the wrist. In white gold, you can really feel the substance. And if you get very close to the dial, you can see that the guillot shape pattern gives it a lovely background texture, along with applique white gold dot indices and numerals. You can see radially arrayed Arabic numerals and half frosted broadsword hands here. The half frosting helping you to see the time more easily. Telemeter as well as a tachymeter scale. It features both, one for judging speed, one for judging distance. Fire it up. I believe I've wound this one. Oh, nope, I need to wind it. Well, Lucky you, because as I wind this watch, you can watch the Vacheron Caliber 1141 come to life. Based on the Le Mania 2310 that also did business in the pre-moon Omegas as the Caliber 321 and in the Patek Philippe 5070 as the CH 2770, this is a manual wind, traditionally raw, traditionally finished lateral clutch column wheel chronograph. And you could see the actuation of that black polished column wheel with its black polished screw center and crenellated caps, the steel satin finish grain of the levers, all of which feature a mirrored englage on their periphery. The same englage lavished on the edges of all the bridges, perfectly aligned Cote de Genève across the spare bridges with an engine turning on the base plate. You'll note two features that are characteristic of these Vacheron caliber 1141s. First, a big slow beating balance at 18,000 vibrations per hour with a handmade Breguet overcoil. All of this is adjusted in five positions like a chronometer. Second, you can see there's a little gold wire from the balance cock to the adjacent bridge that prevents the hairspring from getting hooked on the regulator. So it prevents the overcoil hairspring from doubling up over itself or over the regulator in the event of shock. All of the screws are black polished with chamfered slots and chamfered circumference. This white gold watch is a true majesty. Remember, before the malt collection was tonneaus, it was simply strong, expressive lugs in round case watches. And this one was the formula to perfection. Now, let's say you have a taste for Vacheron, and Dr. VC, I love your Instagram account, I follow you, I also know you're watching, so I'm gonna try to fly the flag for the folks from the Kitalil. And as you can see, we have what was known in 2011 as the Patrimony Contemporain, Launched five years after the arrival of the Excellence or Excellence Platine collection, this is the 43150 reference, made only in 150 individually numbered pieces. This is number 40. The line consisted of watches per the Excellence Platine specification that were entirely of platinum. First, the basic idea behind Excellence. Everything that can be platinum is platinum. That starts with the buckle, which is platinum. It continues through the navy blue alligator leather strap featuring platinum infused threads. The case, of course, 42 millimeters by 7.5 millimeters thick is in platinum. The dial, that's correct, hallmarked PT950 with a media blasted sandpaper texture and the only gold you see is for the hands that indices the logos. And as you can see, even the hands are thoughtfully detailed being half frosted for better contrast against this silver satin base of platinum. Now the lug construction is advanced. As you can see, there is a sharp cleft 
or seam between the lug and the case band, and that sharp break is created by hand finishing. The lug is welded on, and then the welded seam between the two is finished away by hand to create that sharp crease, which gives the lug's character, the case strength, and the watch, the, I, I would say, the sign, the warmth of hand finishing, the warmth of human involvement that you don't get on a conventional stamped or machined case. Now the movement is a legend in its own right. Caliber 1120 designed 1967 by JLC for Vacheron, Patek, and Audemars Piguet. Only those brands have ever used the movement. JLC never did, and you'll find this movement in the very first Royal Oaks. Heck, you'll still find it in the Royal Oak Jumbo, as well as the reference 3700 Nautilus. Now you can see here we have a freehand skeletonized rotor with the Vacheron on Maltese Cross, 21 carat winding mass, the movement only 2.45 millimeters thick. You can see the ring that runs all the way around the movement. That ring right there bears the winding mass, so the rotor itself runs all the way around the movement, almost like a peripheral rotor automatic, so that the winding mechanism can mostly, including the rotor mass itself, be in the same plane as the bridges. That allows the movement to be exceptionally thin, under 2.5 millimeters. You could see the Poisson de Genève or the Geneva Hallmark. This is finished to a level that even Audemars Piguet will struggle to match with its 15202 Royal Oak. Now, 40 hour automatic winding power reserve, it beats away at 19,800 vibrations per hour, a sign of the era from which it emerged, the late 1960s, when 19.8 was considered to be a very contemporary beat rate. On my wrist, 16 centimeters in circumference, it's broad at 42 millimeters, but it's only 46.5 millimeters lug to lug, and again, seven and a half millimeters thick, a Royal Oak Jumbo is 8.2, 8.3 by my caliper. So this is an extraordinarily special, hand-finished, platinum-infused, and ultra-thin dress reference with an important heritage movement that is still made and decorated by hand. Let's shift gears for a moment and talk about sports watches. Specifically, let's talk about a brand that I love. I know some of you do as well because, frankly, you guys are always asking me for used examples of sports watches by Zinn Spezialeuren of Frankfurt, a timepiece that is gorgeous. The 240, now this is the 240 STGZ, 43 millimeters with a lovely media blasted tonneau case, a timepiece that includes a remarkably wearable profile and a no-nonsense machine aesthetic. Now the blue of the dial, the blue of the reference ring, and of course the shock of red of the seconds hand makes this watch uniquely warm and appealing for one of Zinn's solidly tool-oriented, sports-oriented, utility-oriented watches. Again, the warmth of that colorful dial gives this a humane feel that not every Zinn has. And just for contrast, you could see my Zinn EZM11 adjacent. Now, to quickly note, the watch features a Zinn bracelet, which is not something we commonly see. Almost all Zinn watches come on straps, and when they're included on bracelets, it's generally by request of the original owner, so we're lucky to have this one. Now pop open the bracelet, and you can see internally there is a fold-out extension for use over some sort of utility suit. It doesn't have to be a diving suit. It could be a thick winter coat. You have a very substantial machined single swing arm, all of this in stainless steel. And if you look at how the removable links on the bracelet are actually fixed to the watch, it's done with hex screws, not conventional Phillips or flathead screws, and certainly no spring, or I should say, pin sleeves here. You have a clamshell closure system. You have three divots drilled inside the clasp, so you can adjust with a strap tool to change the anchoring point of the bracelet. Now, when you throw this watch on the wrist, it doesn't wear terribly large, because uniquely for a watch that is 100 meters water resistant automatic with an internal rotating bezel. It is only 11 millimeters thick, so you can see how easily I wear this watch on my wrist. There's plenty of clearance on both sides of my wrist to wear this timepiece. You'll also note, if you look at the dial real closely, it has a bilingual calendar as it features two languages on the day facet of the day date complication. And let me demonstrate that to better effect you could see that the day complication in the day date features both English and the watch's native German. 
a timepiece of extraordinary versatility. I truly like this one. This is a timepiece that you can wear anytime, anywhere, with anything because of its thin profile and its easy agreeability with smaller wrists. Now, talking a little bit about a, another non-Swiss sports watch option, this is a watch that represents the post-2017 iteration of the Grand Seiko Spring Drive Diver. This is actually the SPGA 231. The SPGA 229 is the steel version. This is the titanium version, 40. 4.2 millimeters. It's an easy watch to wear because of the lightness. It features the signature black polished Zeratsu case finish, which is done by hand, holding the surface to be milled directly against a titanium milling wheel, with the result that you wind up with a truly mirrored finish. Now, I can show you black polished components and Swiss watches on the table, but they're tiny and they're inside the movement. To render this level of finish, including creases and curves, as well as a satin contrast on a component the size of a case, is truly extraordinary. Now you have a bezel of a high grade with an excellent refined micro detent 120 click action. I'm going to hold it up to the mic so you can hear it because this is truly like a blunt half 50 fathoms. It's not quite Rolex levels of refinement, but we are getting darn close here. Now you'll also note that the dial, easy to read in matte black to reduce glare, 200 meters water resistant screw down crown and spring drive, caliber 9R65, uh, features a automatic winding mechanism, three-day power reserve, a power reserve indicator, a quick set for the date, stop seconds, and you'll note the extraordinary cathedral-style hour hand and broad arrow minute hand. Unusual choices on a dive watch, but hey, so is the lollipop counterweight, which is loomed, by the way, for the seconds. Now, the dive watch features a remarkably adjustable clasp, and, and I'll show you why. Internally, there is a mechanism that allows you to change the sizing while it is still on the wrist. You simply lift two tabs, there are two little lips flanking the system, which is both trigger release and clamshell locked, so you're definitely sure tight, but there is the ability, as you would find with a Rolex Deep Sea, to adjust the length of the extension on the wrist, and because there are many individual stations, you can also use this for fine sizing. It's not just an all or nothing fold out dive extension. It is very versatile, very user friendly, and again, because this system is locked with both triggers and with a clamshell, you know it's staying on the wrist. Throw it on the wrist, it's easy to wear. Even on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, you can see that the case profile is almost like a tunnel with an arc from side to side. Look how curved it is. The lugs arc down and around your wrist, so I can recommend this one, though 44 plus, for a wrist as small as 14 and a half centimeters circumference. A lot of that comes down to the titanium composition of the case and the watch. By the way, the loom on that one is absolutely spectacular. Luma Bright by Grand Seiko, like the their shock protection, like their sapphires, like the oils they use, everything is manufactured, fully vertically integrated. Now we're gonna go high horology, but stick with sports watches here, and we're gonna talk about a watch that's out of production and dearly missed. Folks still covet the new for 2006 Patek Philippe 5980 Nautilus Chronograph. Now the Nautilus Chronograph looks like a Nautilus, and that is a grand compliment, because it incorporates a register for chronograph minutes, as well as chronograph hours, as well as chronograph pushers, without spoiling the basic 1976 Gerald Genta design. At 12.5 millimeters thick, it's not even a thick watch, and despite the through fittings for both the date change, a legacy of the 5960 that shares this movement, as well as the chronograph pushers, it's still 120 meters water resistant. Now, when you throw this one on the wrist, and by the way, I should mention this example is one of the pre-2012 examples. So rather than pin sleeves to size the bracelet here, you could see that the bracelet features screws to remove the links. And you'll also appreciate the fact when we get to the case back, that it is a beautifully executed traditional Patek Philippe execution, but a very modern movement. This is the 28520. Automatic winding, power reserve up to 55 hours. It is, I should mention, a vertical clutch and a column wheel, free sprung with a gyro max balance beaten away at 28,800 vibrations per hour, unidirectional winding with ceramic rotor bearings that are high efficiency, unlubricated, and sealed for life. No maintenance required, but you have the same Cote de Genève perlage 
mirrored on glage, you'll note there's a perlage in spiral form even on the center of the rotor, as well as black polished screws. When you throw it all on the wrist, you can see it's an easy watch to wear, and though it looks imposing, almost like it might be the size of a Royal Oak Offshore, that's only when you're holding it in isolation from the wrist. On the wrist, you can see it really doesn't wear that differently from a Nautilus 5726 annual calendar. A bit thicker, of course, than a 5711, but not necessarily broader across the wrist, and it has a more substantial bracelet than a 5711 with sporting use in mind. Now, I mentioned that this is a flyback chronograph, a feature that Patek didn't really advertise, and you could see that, indeed, I can fly back and restart by pushing the reset trigger. That resets the coaxial minutes and hours. It also allows you to time two events in rapid succession because you reset, you restart with a single push of a single trigger. It's also useful if you want to have center seconds because this watch does not feature a constant second subdial, but because of the vertical clutch of the chronograph, you can simply leave the chronograph engaged and have seconds, minutes, and hours on the same dial. Plus, even though it doesn't feature hacking, if you set the watch precisely and then zero out that hand, it effectively does synchronize to a reference time. A lovely blue gradient dial that fades from a silver blue at the center to navy blue metallic at the edge with all white gold batal hands as well as indices applique. Now, sticking with our high horology luxury sports watch theme, I'm going to talk about something that frankly is a little bit underrated but represents a comeback for a model line that staggered out of the gate. Back in 2016, we received a third generation Vacheron Constantin overseas, and frankly, it was everything that the overseas needed to be to match Audemars Piguet and Patek, but it was at the worst possible time. Vacheron overseas typically sold in the high teens to low twenties retail, with discounts which were common in the second generation. Most people were used to getting their overseas in the teens, mid to high teens. So when these watches arrived, with prices in the low to high 20s, people balked. It was a recession for the watch industry, 2015 to 2017, and this watch arrived in the middle of it at a price people were not used to paying for an overseas. Now, the fun thing here is that Vacheron really did invest in new features, including a quick release system that allows you to rapidly swap straps and bracelets, and significantly, you get two extra straps, one leather, one rubber, with this watch, both black to match the dial. The black black lacquered dial was new, an inverse panda, new for 2018, and a lot of folks are saying that this is the version of the chrono that really got the overseas generation 3 going. 42.5 millimeters in stainless steel, the watch included a lot of firsts, and in addition to that wonderful quick release system, you could see that the bracelet features all removable links. Every single link is removable on both sides of the bracelet for fine tuning, and will pop open the clasp. You could see in each side of the clasp, there is a micro adjustment. So you can pull it out approximately one millimeter and a half, one to one and a half millimeters on each size. So not only can you remove every link, but you can also size with that built-in micro adjustment. I mentioned this was a watch that reflected significant investment in firsts, and I'm not just blowing smoke, guys, because this watch featured Vacheron's first overseas manufacturer movement. You're looking at caliber 5200 here, Geneva Hallmark, five-position chronometer style adjustment, compass rose, 22 carat, not 21, not 18, 20 22 carat rose gold triple finished compass rose style oscillating mass, ceramic rotor bearings, 28.8 beat rate, 52 hour power reserve, and of course a vertical clutch and a column wheel. The watch is still, in spite of the display case back, 150 meters water resistant, which surpasses every Patek Philippe sports watch and all but the diver models of the Royal Oak Offshore. Now there's more. Of course there's more. The watch is also anti-magnetic, the same 25,000 ampere per meter as the previous solid iron cage models that had solid case backs. This was another first, a solid case back on the second and first generations, a display case back for the first time over the first manufacture movement on the third. And because there is an iron ring paramagnetic around the movement, that actually channels magnetic field lines around the vulnerable hairspring. So you can have a display case back without being any more vulnerable to magnets. This is a superior product and it is finally getting the recognition both new and pre-owned that it deserved out of the gate. So let's talk a little bit about the value propositions. Watches that cost less and still give you perhaps 80% of the enjoyment of a high horology model. Launched for 2018, the same year that Black Dial Overseas variant came out, the Oris Aquas Date Green Ceramic. 43.5 millimeters in stainless steel. You can see this one is an upscale diver featuring 
a distinctive case shape that breaks away from the common integrated lug design language of the main players in the space, the Breitlings, the Omegas, and the Rolex. You'll also note an extraordinary level of quality for a watch in this price point, screw-fixed bars to hold the straps to the case, not spring bars, modular crown guards that can be removed by screw and replaced if they get gouged, and then not an anodized aluminum insert, but a ceramic insert for the diving bezel and an extravagant green metallic dial. Now the watch, of course, being 300 meters water resistant, gives you all the technical capability you'd get in something like a Rolex Submariner, but you could see that the strap is fully integrated, a feature you will not find from the factory on any Submariner, no daylight showing between strap and case. A Highly integrated look, and you'll note on the bottom, little hollows to let the wrist ventilate on a hot day. You could see the Salida SW200 base movement, thanks to the display case back. The watch featuring a rather deluxe strap and deluxe buckle. I did not expect this level of specification. Not only do you have twin trigger release, not the cheap clamshell Breitling generally uses, which gives you, by the way, the twin triggers greater security, but internally, it is both engine turned and satin finished with external polish. And that's just my fingerprints there, guys. The polish is an outstanding condition, you could see a triple finish, engine turning satin and polish on this clasp, and that's not even the end of it. There is a push button adjustment mechanism that is built in that allows you to slide and adjust the sizing all the way if you wish for a dive suit or incrementally to find the perfect fit on your wrist. That is not expected in a watch at this price point. Now, though it is a large watch at 43.5, it does not wear that way thanks to the short cropped and tightly downturned lugs as well as the supple, flexible, and I must say deliciously vanilla scented vulcanized rubber strap. You can see how easily it sits on a 16 centimeter circumference wrist. I adore this piece. After Omega's 25th anniversary Seamaster last year, I have to say that might have been the best debut in the sports watch category of the year. That said, we've got a lot of propositions in the value segment, one of which is from Omega's own flagship dive line. Excluding the pro profs, which are better described as professional equipment, this is a luxury timepiece that is beautiful, enduring, sophisticated in its technology, monotone in its aesthetic, and wearable in its 39.5 millimeter size. This is the full black ceramic that is case, dial, and bezel insert, full black ceramic, Seamaster Professional Planet Ocean. Now let's listen to the bezels of the last two divers I've discussed. Let's start with the Oris. It's surprisingly refined. One of the best I've experienced, sharp, vocal, and yet precise. And now the Planet Ocean. The Planet Ocean's a little bit grittier than the Oris. It has a different feel. It also has a different knurling, which is much sharper. And I have to say the Planet Ocean's easier to grip. Now you don't give up anything. 600 meters water resistant, of course. Helium escape valve, you better believe it, with a lovely metallic and ceramic black contrast, that's one of the highlights of this watch, the contrast between the metal elements and the ceramic. You'll also note that Omega finishes ceramic the same way they do metal, with satin finish on the case flank and polish on the bevels, and that's achieved using diamond-tipped milling tools. You can see that metal crown. The dial, you'll, you'll note very closely below the cannon pinion, zirconium oxide, so it too is made of ceramic, which gives you the enduring qualities of enamel without the vulnerabilities of enamel or the expense of enamel. You get all applique, tri-Arabic numerals and indices, monotone black date disc, turn it all over, 55 hour power reserve, chronometer certified caliber 8800. Now it is a master chronometer, which means this is a Metaz caliber, which means it is tested in five positions, not the chronometer, or I should say six positions, not the chronometer five, and as a fully cased up finished watch, not the COSC's bare movement. Also, it's tested for winding efficiency, power reserve, water resistance, and anti-magnetism. A coaxial chronometer using the Metaz standard created by Omega and the Swiss Federal Institute of Metrology, this is easily the most desirable and wearable Planet Ocean to me. As at 39.5 millimeters, you're in direct competition with conventional Rolex sizes, as well as Omega's own 42 millimeter diver 300 meter. But because of the ceramic, which is nearly indelible, these watches will not scratch, scuff, degrade in the way that metal watches will. They wind up looking as clean, as straight, and as sharp 20, 30 years later. If you're not the type of person to shatter sapphire crystals, you're not going to chip or fracture a ceramic case. A watch I adore, and I should mention Omega going the extra mile, whereas most ceramic watches, <coughs> Hublot, will feature some sort of 
PVD titanium or steel buckle. Omega gives you a full ceramic buckle cap. So while the interior is composed of titanium, the buckle that will go desk diving and scratch on surfaces under your wrist, that right there is indelible ceramic. Nicely done, Omega. Now let's turn back the clock, or I should say the watch, to the 1990s, the mid-1990s, and let's talk a little bit about this mid-90s 3590 Speedmaster Professional. Roughly 1992, three or four, this model you have right here. 42 millimeter moon watch. You could see that it is a tritium dial. Omega switched over in 1997. So this is not Fotina. This is the real thing. 42 millimeters, a 861 yellow gilt coated version, 17 joules of the caliber 861. This was a transitional version of the 861 between the rose gold coating, the copper colored coating, and the 1997 to present rhodium plate. This one was gold or gilted. Now you can see that it features the same Hesalite thermoplastic because you get that wild off axis distortion. And you can even see that there is a little Omega, I don't know how well you can see it on camera, but there's a little Omega logo on the underside of the plexiglass, and that tells you it is an Omega factory plexiglass. You've got your base 500 tachymeter for gauging the speed of things moving very quickly, and inside the case, 48 hour power reserve, Lamagna based. Moonwatch caliber 861. This Moonwatch is in outstanding condition. It has the look, the stance, the feel, the persona of a 145.022, but decades newer, so the condition both of watch and of bezel is far superior. Matching tritium hands and dial, a lovely watch, and one for the cognoscenti or those who are monuments men. That is to say, those who will collect one important, that is core watch, from many different brands. You've got your Reverso 1931, you've got your Daytona, you've got your Calatrava, your Nautilus, your Royal Oak. Well, you need to have a moon watch, and a vintage moon watch is the way to go. Now let's turn back the clock again, another 20 years previous, to the reference 176007. I, I used 007 and Omega in the same sentence without referencing James Bond, because this is the reference 176007. It is a Seamaster chronograph powered by Omega's first automatic chronograph caliber, the Lamagna. 1040. Doing business as the Omega Caliber 1340 here. Automatic winding. You can see that characteristic of the Lamagna 1040. A radial 60 minute indicator. So every minute that hand jumps. It's a wonderful feature that was carried on to the follow-up caliber, the Lamagna 5100. And the Lamagna 5100 powered the original 1990s Zin Easy M1. When Zin made my watch, the 1-1, one, one, the tribute to the 1, it re-engineered a Valju 7750 to to work with that radial minutes hand that was a legacy of this original movement and the design fundamentals it laid down for Lamagna. Now you'll also note there is a 24-hour sub-register with constant seconds. They're coaxial. They are adjacent at 9 o'clock. That 24-hour register is for the it is for the hands at center, for the local hours. So you know whether you're looking at day or night. The hour counter is at the base of the dial, and you can see this one has turned a little bit with time, but it's not stained or tarnished, it's not water damaged, it is just the galvanizing process altering over time with exposure to the elements. It's in very good condition, but it, it's like a tropical dial. The coloration is a sign of its age and a hallmark of a survivor. Plexiglass crystal, the watch is only about 38.9 millimeters wide by about 43.5 millimeters lug to lug, and you can see that plexiglass tall, crowned and in remarkably good shape. Now throw it on the wrist. This is a watch that's very important. It was made from about 1972 to 1976, or at least that's when it was cataloged. And you can see on the wrist, it remains an outstanding option with a 1970s style cushion case. It's a lugless profile and it will look great on a strap, but on the Omega Factory bracelet, which is contemporary to the watch, it has a nicely integrated look sitting well on the wrist. You can see as with the Zin prior, uh, the Zin 240 had that same cushion case profile with plenty of space on either side of the wrist. So you can wear this watch as with the Zin on a really small wrist down to about 13 or 13 and a half centimeters circumference. A very important movement and model for Omega. Now let's go back into the realm of high horology and talk about something that is frankly not mentioned often enough. You would think a Patek Philippe world time would get a lot of play, but for some reason the 2016 to present Patek Philippe 5930G just doesn't get a lot of discussion with an extraordinary ricochet like 
Guilloche center dial galvanized blue, a world-time complication that runs the periphery of its dial. And as you can see, the Louis Cotier designed 24-hour adjacent city system, but also with Louis Cotier's second major innovation developed with Patek in the 50s, the stepper system that allows you to change your reference city. You can see, let's say I am in Mexico DF, I'm in Mexico City right now, and you can see that, well, it is approximately 7... 36 or so. Well, let's say I'm going to jump to London. Now the watch has done all of the math for me. And you can see that the city chapter ring can be manipulated separately by using that pusher. And then you can set the time with the crown, which advances the counter-rotating 24-hour reference ring for city time. And you'll appreciate that the system gives you distinction between day and night. Now, turn it all over. You can see that the lugs are remarkably strong for Patek. Patek case making started in the 1980s, with Patek beginning to make its own cases as it purchased Atelier Reuni. Well, initially, the cases were very simple. Think 3940. Over time, they've become more sophisticated with welded lug profiles, impressive engraving, hollow lugs, all sorts of stylistic flourishes that have made Patek case construction equal to the best specialists in the world. Now, 39.5 millimeters on my wrist it wears a bit larger than that. It is a world-time chronograph, and it uses the same base movement as the Nautilus chronograph that we just discussed. So you can see this one with silicon hairspring, six-position adjustment, Patek Philippe seal, guaranteed to run no worse than minus three plus two seconds per day. I should probably wind this one up. And the watch features the same relatively unadvertised refinement that you find on the 5980 and the 5960, but the chronograph system on this watch is a flyback. You'll also appreciate that there is a smaller minutes counter than you'll find on the 5980. The timepiece features a full Patek Philippe matching white gold filigree style buckle with a wire style Calatrava cross, a really impressive piece that doesn't get enough attention, especially as it's a complicated Patek with a white metal case and a blue dial. I thought collectors would be all over that, but collectors are not always predictable, or perhaps they're too predictable and they all want this. Okay, now talking about a brand that's hardly ever mentioned on the show, Maurice Lacroix, Canton of Hura, the village of Senelegier, a timepiece based on a name that was drawn from a hat, effectively, in the 1970s, when a company called Desco von Schulteis decided to create a watch brand. Maurice Lacroix was a middle manager with the company. This is the 43 millimeter rose gold and stainless steel Maurice Lacroix Masterpiece Calendrier Retrograde. So you have a retrograde calendar, you have a power reserve, 42 hours, and of course you have that lovely stepped and fluted bezel with a handsome set of match fluted lugs and a gorgeous high-grade 6498 caliber on the back. Note the double spiral graining of the ratchet wheel. The detailing here is thoughtful and extensive. The grade delivered is either top or chronometer for this 6498. And you can tell that from the balance in the hairspring. And then there's a custom Maurice Lacroix micrometric regulator. It is a large movement, over 36 millimeters in diameter, that fills the entirety of the case back. The original 6497 and 6498 were created in the 1950s for pocket watches and desk clocks. So when you have a large modern watch, it makes sense to use 6497 or 98, as Panerai learned. This watch has a grace, a rarity, and a delicacy that you will not find on Panerai watches. It's a wonderful way to have a watch none of your friends own and to get into complications at an affordable and attractive price. That is a very unusual watch, and its rarity endears it to me. Now, if we could talk for a moment about a timepiece that is not in any way rare, but is wildly successful and popular precisely because its formula appeals to all. This is a 2019 iteration of the 2016 to present Tudor Black Bay Bronze. Uh, inside, you have 70 hour silicon hairspring chronometer certified, manufacturer caliber MT560125 joules, full bridge, free sprung, chronometer certified, 
288 beat rate, you have a matte gray dial, you have a matte gray bezel insert, and because this is the Black Bay Bronze, it is 43 millimeters rather than the standard 41. Still an impressive 200 meter diver on the wrist, it bears elements of both Tudor and Rolex Submariners from the 1950s and 60s, back when they shared cases, they shared crowns, they even shared bracelets. What sets this one apart is that it's got a little bit of all eras of Tudor in it, as the big crown pre-crown guards are evoked by the rose logo, crown guard free crown. Then you could see that there was a Tudor shield logo. That's the post-1968 logo. You've got the look of an early Tudor, like, let's say, 7922 or 7924 Submariner, but then you have the, the snowflake hands from the late 60s to mid-70s Tudor Submariners. So this watch includes a pastiche of features that are broadly grin-inducing and very wearable. One feature I love here is this wonderfully aged, rusticated calfskin strap that's included. It's a wonderfully thick cut of material, and you can see those layers with the contrasting binding and stitch, and it has this handsome distressed pattern on the top, even though, as you could clearly see, this is a brand new Tudor factory strap with a wonderfully silky suede on the bottom. Sticking for a moment with mainstream brands, but one that's not too mainstream, let's talk about Zenith and what I have considered for five years running to be the best buy in complications. You can pick these up for around $10,000, launched in 2012, the 45 millimeter steel Zenith Pilot Double-Matic. Hey, Patek, take a seat. This thing is a high beat El Primero automatic chronograph. You could see the caliber on the case back with its column wheel and lateral clutch, beaten away at 10 beats per second, 36,000 vibrations per hour, Let's fire this one up. I probably need to wind this one too. The watch also includes a grand date or an oversized date that includes its own quick set mechanism. So we've got a high beat automatic chronograph, a grand date with a quick set. We've got a world time. As you can see, I can change my reference city placing whatever my reference city is up at 12 o'clock, which is the index on this watch. And of course, I'm in Philadelphia, so my reference city is New York. And you could see in New York, it is between 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the evening. And we know this because it's a 24-hour reference ring. And it will soon, because this is counter-rotating, it is counterclockwise rotating, it will soon be night where I am. Now, we're not done. There is also an on-off indicator for the alarm, because the alarm has an on, well, let me keep my chronograph running so you can see it. The alarm has an on-off indicator. Green is armed. Red is off, but we're not done as there's a power reserve as well for this alarm. And you can see it is currently full. Not only is there a power reserve, it is a shape-shifting, color-changing power reserve. Let's see of which I speak. Smaller green, bigger red, orbital, transforming, against the mic, deactivated. All of that in one watch. Does it get better? It does. The numerals are solid cut blocks of Super Luminova, so the loom shot is volcanic. Throw it on the wrist, full deployant clasp, contrasting stitch, alligator, not calfskin strap. And you can see, even though it's a 45, I'm wearing it easily. I would gladly own this watch. I love Zenith, the El Primero. I love the model. I'm not a pilot, but then again, this one's just as apt for armchair aviators. And absolutely monstrous complication. That's the only word I can use. One of the best values, rarest modern complications from Zenith, most impressive watches from the Jean-Frédéric Dufour era, a short golden age of Zenith early in this de decade. And if you want the best watch from that era, that's probably it. Let's talk about independence. Let's talk about a couple of very special independents. Let's start with De Batoon of La Berson, Switzerland, led by genius watchmaker Denis Flageolet, known for the flamboyant DB28s and their floating lugs, but this DB25 automatic gives you everything De Batoon is without the excess, without the size or the bombast. 40 millimeters in glorious polished red gold. You can see it features a guilloche dial with a billowing rose lathe pattern and then beautiful blue radially arrayed Roman numerals outboard. Note the double drilled crown and then turn it all over. Caliber 2424 automatic winding. It features an extended days long power reserve, five to six days. Note the shock protection system at the center, patented back in 2006 to make the balance, or I should say the, the rotor, 
more shock resistant. Now there's also a, a system, I was thinking ahead, to make the balance more shock resistant. By the way, take a note, platinum mass outboard for maximum polar moment. You'll also appreciate we have the shock protected rotor and we have the shock protected balance. Inca block at center for the balance staff and then there are two flanking springs on each side. Triple parachute to enable the system to absorb immense abuse. A patented system from Debitum. There is a silicon escape wheel of their own design. There is a balance of their own design featuring white gold bulbs and a titanium set of yoke arms. It's a cross-shaped wheel. It's not actually a conventional annular rim. And it features a flat hairspring, again, of the company's own design that is best able to keep time in any orientation without the shock vulnerability of an overcoil. Throw it on the wrist and you can see the watch is extravagant in its details, but chaste in its dimensions. An easy watch to wear, you can own Debatoon quality from a brand that only makes 150 watches a year, all of them hand finished and elaborately specced. This is one of the best independents of our time and of all time, and this is one of the best ways to get in without being extravagant, outlandish, or extroverted. Now, continuing on our independence kick, we need to talk a little bit about Moser. H. Moser and C is a brand going places, and this is the Endeavor Center Second. 40.8 millimeters in pink gold. You can see that mirror polished set of lug hollows that distinguishes Moser cases. Beautifully sculpted like molten metal, flash frozen. You can even see the attention to detail as there is a kerf or notch under the crown so you can more easily dig in your fingernail. Moser caliber HMC 343. Everything's made in house down to the balance, the escapement, and the hairspring. Overcoil hairspring spring, free sprung, full bridge architecture for shock protection, twin mainspring barrels set in screw fixed chiton, seven day power reserve claimed it will actually run for nine, 18,000 vibration per hour beat rate, stop seconds, an overcoil hairspring, and then adjacent to it you have a small power reserve indicator on the case back. Note the double crested Moser stripes, that's their form of Cote de Genève, throw it on the wrist, and because of those sharply curved and short lugs it wears easily on a small wrist, and I mean real easily. Plus, it features their famed Fumé gradient dial, which fades from silver at its center to almost brown bronze at its edge, lush and lustrous in its metallic glint and gleam. We have Laurent Ferrier, the Galet micro rotor, with an unconventional vintage-inspired radially arrayed Arabic numeral dial, a very select piece from them. Now, this one is in 18 karat white gold, 40 millimeters, with that lovely smooth pebble-like Galet shape, caliber FBN 229, 35 joules, six position adjustment, double direct impulse escapement, overcoil hairspring. You could see rotor with a jeweled staff and ratchets for silent winding, three day power reserve, and some of the finest finish. And I don't even need to tell you what you're getting. You could see the black polish, the stripes, the mirrored unglage, the engine turning, the guilloche cut on the winding mess, and all of those black polished screws. Throw it on the wrist, it's a dream. The underside of the strap is suede calfskin or Alcantara, and it wears wonderfully comfortable with lugs that are shaped to suit a small wrist and style shaped to last. As you can see, the form, the detail, Details, everything will look as good 50 years hence as it does today. That is one of the few modern independents that I see not just going the distance as a company, because I think they have the best product, competitive with Moser, competitive with Debetun, but I think that the designs are less voguish than other independents. They're not trying too hard. Patek Philippe, and this is the original 5270G in white gold. Note the absence of a tachymeter, of a chin, of any of that excess clutter. You have a nice open, vertically satin finished, stainless steel like dial, and on the case back, 65 hour power reserve, manufacture, manual wind, column wheel, lateral clutch caliber. 29,535. Now I'll wind this one up so you can see it spring to action. Here you have an overcoil hairspring. You have six position adjustment, one more than chronometer standard. You do, as a matter of fact, have hacking seconds. So the watch does feature a stop seconds functionality. And as you can see, it is a larger movement than the CH2770, the Lamagna base caliber that preceded it. You could see how visible the mechanism of the chronograph is right down to the recentering of the chronograph by means of the hammers and heart cams. Throw it on the wrist, 41 millimeters. This is an easy, high complication to wear. It's not as compact as the 5930 we discussed before, but it is easy to wear relative to some of Patek Philippe's grander, grand complications. If a 6300 Grand Master Chime is just too, shall we say, 
oh, I don't know, Jay-Z for your taste, I think he's wearing one these days, then this is going to be the watch you want, the cleanest and original version of the 5270 Perpetual Calendar Chronograph. Jumping along, we have one hell of a finisher on the table tonight, so consider that the watches I'm about to show you merely set up today's finisher, starting with two-tone. Classical two-tone yellow gold and stainless steel Rolex, the annual calendar, GMT, three-day power reserve, chronometer certified, 100 meter water resistant, 42 millimeter Rolex Sky Dweller. Now you can see here we have a lovely champagne gold sunburst dial and a matching gold metallic 24 hour second uh, reference at center. A lot of times when this is white, it winds up looking a little bit too much like a clash with the dial base. Instead, gold to match, this is more nicely integrated. So you have that 24 hour second time zone, you have the date, and then you have a little red square that jumps around the dial, 12 hours, 12 months. So you have the date and you have the month, and that's how the annual calendar displays the calendar. That's how it displays the date and the month. And it need be adjusted only once a year, the jump from February to March. Now, that's impressive, and we're gonna throw it on the wrist real quick to show you how 42 millimeter sky dwellers wear. And the first thing I can tell you is that it wears like a giant date just. If you know the shape of a date just and the contours of its case, that's exactly how this wears. You could see, and that's a great angle, an easy watch to wear in spite of its 42 millimeter size, it wears nothing like the 42 millimeter Explorer 2. A nice curved set of lugs, a very short, extended end link to the bracelet, and I normally measure end link to end link. Here, effectively, the lug to lug dimension of approximately 50 millimeters is the span across the wrist. So an easy one to wear, and in the 13 millimeter range, it's thinner than you think. Now, Previewed in 2007, but launched in 2008, the Glasuta Original Senator Retropont, a timepiece that, as you could see, represents not just a split-second chronograph, that's all well and good. Everyone loves a split, especially when it's as colorful as this set of red and blue hands, but it is also a flyback chronograph. It is both a retropont and a flyback awesome stuff, split seconds capability, and a caliber 9901 movement that allows you to revel in the complexity of the watch. Finished as well as anything from a Longo Unzona, the 47 Joule manual wind movement features blued screws, black polished screws, satin finished steel chronograph levers. It features a column wheel. Heck, it features two column wheels, one and two, both black polished, engine turning across the base plate, freehand engraving on the half bridge, underneath a black polished swan's neck fine adjustment mechanism. Now you could see that the watch features a fully jeweled lateral clutch, no bushings here, zero cost cutting, and the 42 millimeter pink gold case wears beautifully on the wrist. You could see the counter display, uh, unconventional, the constant seconds as well as the chronograph sub-register, you could see that it, it's hardly the standard chronograph dial layout. So not only is the movement distinctively Glasuta, but so is the dial itself. Everything about this watch is standout, and you could see how narrow it is across the wrist. The lugs are very short cropped, and I have plenty of clearance on both sides, so I can recommend this 42 for a wrist as small as 14 centimeters circumference. And again, when you've got a watch like this, on which Everything comes together, from the color, to the size, to the fit, to the complexity, to the finish, to the brand, to the story, and the rarity. You have something that is beyond compelling. You have something that can be described as close to best in class. But the most special watch on the table today comes from Ulysse Nardin. Now, if I were to cover up the brand, would you know this is from the folks who spent two decades pandering to Russian new money? But sure enough, Ulysse Nardin. Grand Faux Minute Repeater, 38.5 millimeters, Grand Faux Enamel Dial from Donze Cadran, fired up to 20 times at 800 degrees centigrade. You could see the radially arrayed stylized Roman numerals with a watchmaker's four and yellow gold, or I should say, pink gold leaf hands to match the pink gold case, and an extravagantly finished manual wind, 18,000 vibration per hour, 48 hour power reserve, minute repeater caliber. If this were made in Geneva, it could be Geneva Hallmark. It's that good. And now, let's hear what it has to say. The last word on the show belongs to the watch.
Uh, the cardinal sin of setting a minute repeater. I wound past 12.59 to 1. Okay, take two. I'm going to set it to 12.58 just to be careful. Throw it on the wrist. 38.5 millimeters. A perfect watch. Guys, Team Osso at thewatchbox.com is your direct purchase and query line for anything you see here on the show. Thanks to you, thanks to my crew. Have a dynamite final shopping weekend before the holidays. Stay safe. Time out, Tim out, and thank you for logging on. <laughs>